All right. Well, thank you guys again. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Wes Lambert. I uh, just wanted to talk to you guys today about uh, just some ways in which you can start thinking about how to automate security use cases if you aren't already. Uh, just some simple kind of ways to get started with in it in and, and what types of nodes you might use and, and that sort of thing. So uh, continuing with that, um, I am a husband to an amazing, beautiful wife and father of four crazy kids. Uh, as mentioned, I'm a principal engineer at Security Engine Solutions, um, where uh, we have an enterprise security monitoring platform that is free and open that we help folks to implement, and uh, we maintain that there at Security Engine Solutions, uh, Security Engine. And uh, I have about 10 years, a little over 10 years of experience in IT and information security, uh, kind of in that same discipline, in that same vein. Uh, and really enjoy building those solutions that help security analysts and engineers work smarter, uh, you know, more efficiently and not harder. So that's that's what I kind of want to get folks thinking about today. Uh, and really, you know, when we think about security and, and you know, we hear about it all the time about, uh, you know, these, these threats and these breaches and everything else. Um, as a blue teamer, um, security can be hard, right? I mean, there are a lot of different areas. Uh, like compliance, um, you know, a lot of different technical controls, right? Um, just different things. I mean, the whole discipline is is huge, and there are so many things to think of. And um, you know, as a blue teamer, it's often said that you know we have to think of all the ways that uh, bad guys can break in, and they just have to find a one way to break in, right? Um, so it it can definitely be hard. And uh, you know, the fact that there are these secure coding methodologies and uh, practices that are in place, um, these don't always necessarily equate to secure software, right? Um, and these next generation firewalls, um, just having one in place does not necessarily mean that you have next level uh, enterprise security. Um, there are always gonna be gaps and vulnerabilities, right? Bad guys are always gonna be finding ways to get in, to poke at the software and, and find these little holes. And, um, you know, there are always gonna be those bad guys or, or even just people playing around and, and uh, having opportunistic, um, you know, fun with your um, with your attack surface. So um, again, security is hard, and and you know we just have to keep that in mind, and and keep in mind that there we're always going to have to keep at it. Um, you know, there's never really going to be a stopping point. Uh, and the solution, right? So what what is the solution? Uh, again, there's there's no silver bullet, right? No one size fits all approach. Uh, everybody's enterprise is different. Everybody's attack surface and threat model is different. Uh, and really the most important thing here is to be able to, no matter what your resources, uh, you know, a lot of times folks, uh, you know, today or businesses today, uh, they may not have that many uh, people on their security team. They might not have a dedicated security team. So we have to be able to scale these operations, these folks, that are in these roles, um, we have to be able to scale analysis and scale response and be able to do that efficiently and effectively, right? So that's that's one of the goals of, of what I want to talk about today. Um, and the overall goals, I think, with these, you know, these folks and these teams, really, uh, first and foremost, to reduce that alert fatigue, right? So there may be, um, you know, aside from tuning, there may be hundreds or thousands or you know maybe even millions of alerts uh, in some alert queue that an analyst is going to be investigating on, on a regular daily basis. Um, we want to try to automate that and, and really reduce that fatigue and, and try to you know make things more efficient where we can and in doing so really focusing on those tasks that are repetitively uh, performed or you know performed day in day out again and again by analysts. Uh, that don't really make sense for them to keep doing, you know, going off and clicking and, and kind of doing the same thing to arrive at maybe a, a yes or no or um, some kind of answer that can be selected from a box, right? Like, um, we don't want to eliminate the analyst either, right? So we want to keep the analyst in the equation. We need that human factor, right? Machines aren't the best at everything. We need that human uh, you know, that cognitive ability, that ability to discern given certain context. And that's what's really important here is, is providing a lot of context to an analyst more quickly so they can come to a decision around an investigation, uh, you know, more quickly and, and resolve that investigation with that alert. Uh, so that's really the goal here, to increase the amount of context available and to do it quickly, right, empower the analyst. 
So one common use case here, uh, and I'm gonna be going through these kind of quickly because I've got a little bit to cover here, um, is gonna be uh, initial alert triage, right? Or reputation check. Uh, typically an analyst might be sifting through an alert queue, going through some IDS alerts or other types of alerts from a security system, right? Um, so one of the things that we might want to do is, is pull the system for new alerts or maybe send a notification if we get a new alert um, you know, from a certain security system. Maybe it's an IDS, maybe it's uh, you know, a network-based IDS, or maybe it's a host-based IDS intrusion detection system. Uh, maybe it meets a th certain threshold, right? Uh, maybe we want to query virus total for it and see if it has any context available for us, or maybe some other, other source of information, maybe some internal data, some repository that we have and maybe we want to send an external alert, right? Or some sort of notification if it exceeds that threshold or it matches some value. This is you know, one of those use cases that we might want to look into to help analysts get that context more quickly and uh, be able to resolve that investigation of that alert more quickly, right? Focus on the things that matter and make the best use of their time. So in doing that, uh, here's a simple example workflow. I don't have a link for it here, but I can definitely produce that later. But uh, again, to get a feel of what you might use here, you might use something like an interval trigger um, to basically perform that polling at an interval. And there may be a better way to do this. Uh, I'm certainly not an, in it an expert. So, um, but that's one way is using the interval trigger, say every minute or every 30 seconds or every 10 seconds to poll. If you have an Elasticsearch database where your IDS or host space intrusion detection alerts are, are housed or other types of alerts, a SIM, uh, we can query that. Uh, and then we can use that, you know, we can use the HTTP node to query that and then transform that data uh, with that function node. And then uh, if we need to submit that data, however it's transformed, we can submit that to VirusTotal, we can submit that to, you know, some internal repo. And then we can come to some determination more quickly and we can even chain these events together right so if we don't really know that this is you know potentially malicious yet we can kind of shift these around because this is a very contrived use case um, but we can continue chaining those outputs and, and building that that context right and then so based on that switch node if we feel like it's not necessarily malicious or something that we're deeming noteworthy right now we can acknowledge or dismiss the alert Right. Um, and then we can send an email if we do feel like that's something that we want to investigate further. Or maybe it's Slack or you know, maybe it's Discord um, or, you know, it's some additional piece of information. Uh, we could use an HTTP node to add on to that alert, right, to tack on additional details uh, back into the SIM or back into that, that data platform. Uh, so that, that might be one way that you can achieve that. Right. Again, a very simple example. Um, but just a way kind of to get started thinking about how you might chain that together and, and produce the results that you're looking for. <clears throat> Excuse me, get some water real quick. Now, continuing on from use case one, another use case, and, and I'm sorry, so let me say, um, let me back up a little bit. So one repository uh, here, like if you're running security in, so um, you know, I work for security and solutions, obviously, um, but that, that might be an example here. I, I realized I just forgot to go back and address this, but uh, security in would house both those host space and IDS based alerts and other types of alerts and data that you can kind of uh, you know, pivot from there if you wanna work from that, that workflow. But going forward, if you wanna use something like an EDR platform, or uh, you know something like an endpoint visibility tool, maybe we have a use case where we want to search all of our hosts across our enterprise that are enrolled in that platform uh, for a particular IOC, right? Maybe we've gone through and we have an alert and uh, we've investigated that alert to a certain degree on one host and we found this malicious executable or this file or whatever. Um, what if we want to search all other hosts and see if it's present there, uh, you know, um, what's a quick, easy way to do that? Uh, well, we can do that in a somewhat automated fashion if we want to, right? So we could indicate this observable as an IOC in something like Security NN or another case management platform. Uh, we can have something watching, right? Um, if that particular 
platform has the ability to send to a webhook, we can do that and send to the webhook trigger, or we can use that HTTP polling input again. Um, and we can also, again, route the observable if it's a hash or a file name, we can route that based on the type, and then we can perform a call to you know, some EDR platform to search that fit codes for that particular IOC, right? And maybe if an IOC is found in that box, maybe something that we know to be malicious, we want that host to be quarantined right away, right? We want to cut off access. So maybe if it's you know trying to perform C2 and exfil data, we want to cut off that communication and really only be able to connect to it from that endpoint or that EDR platform. So that might be something we want to do as well. <clears throat> so an example of that would be, again, I mentioned if that case management platform supports sending notifications to webhook, we can use the webhook trigger here and in it in, and that switch node to route by observable type. So if it's a hash, then we can go over here to the hash hunt and for Velociraptor, for example, our EDR tool of choice here, we can perform a hunt across all of our enrolled clients. Uh, so every machine that we have enrolled uh, in Velociraptor and search for that hash on disk, right? And if it's found, um, I'll show you here some other magic in just a minute, we can then perform additional actions either through N8N or the EDR tool itself. And these hash hunts right here are really used, or I'm sorry, utilized by the execute command node. So what we're doing here is it's actually just executing a local command, a local Python client uh, to go off and perform that call. And I'm going to talk more about that and get in detail in just a minute with kind of a, an example implementation of, of what I put together. Everybody good so far? Everybody follow along? Good? Okay. Awesome. All right. So tying it all together, um, a while back, and this is, I think, uh, kind of how Hershel and I uh, started talking, I uh, put together an article about using um, security and in with the Hive, a free and open source platform, or I'm sorry, a free and open platform. Uh, they've kind of changed their licensing model now, but for case uh, management and incident management, uh, N8N and Velociraptor uh, to each kind of take on the role of that, uh, you know, that data platform uh, with the intrusion detection system, uh, the log management, the automation case management and EDR platform. So it's really an article put together to kind of walk you through how to set all this up together. And I call it SOAR Lab just because it's security and, and uh, you know, with the automation and response, it's, it's not necessarily you know, a complete SOAR, but uh, you can check out those links there. And what I'm going to do next is just kind of walk through a couple of those components that are in there. So the overall workflow is going to be that, you know, we see an interesting alert in security and, in, and then we create a case for that alert. And then we have a platform called Elast Alert running, which is going to be polling itself those that data in security and, in. and it's going to tell us whenever an observable or an IOC is added to a case in security and. In. And then from there, it's going to hit that N8N webhook and go through that workflow I described earlier. And this link down here is going to be an example of that workflow that you can implement along with those SOAR lab resources on GitHub. So going into a little bit more, uh, here's an example of a case that was created from an alert in security ending. So what happened here was a file was extracted out of the network stream and analyzed by a tool called Strelka. And what Strelka did was it applied a Yara to the rule, or I'm sorry, to the file. And then it detected that it was indeed a malicious batch file. And then it created an alert in security ending. And then from there, we escalated to a case inside of security ending. We created a case from that alert. And then we created an observable here from that event. So this file, it had an MD5 hash. Yes, I know MD5 is not obviously not the best of hashes for files, but uh, for academic purposes, we'll use it here. Um, so we had the MD5 hash here from the event that was related to that file. And that file was called poker.bat. It was a batch file that was detected. And then we've added an observable in security and in to associate it to that case that we created. And when we did that, what happened was an elast alert rule uh, was going off and it was perusing the data. It was checking to see if there were any new observables added to a case. And then once there was, it went off and hit the N8N webhook right here. And then once it hits that webhook, what's going to happen is um, obviously it's going to receive the notification. 
and then it's going to go through. It's going to hit that switch node. It's going to see that it's a hash. Uh, I know this is empty here, maybe not the best example, but uh, it's going to see that it's a hash. So it's going to move on to that execute command node. And what is going to happen here is what I mentioned before was it's going to execute that local Python client. And then it's going to start a hunt in Velociraptor for this hash across all endpoints. Right. So now what we're doing is we're we're taking you know some automation from NADN and we're also doing some other components from other platforms, right? We don't necessarily have to do everything through NADN. We could separately call each, uh, you know, call the hunt and then the hunt results and do everything else. But for our purpose, we're just going to call the hunt and then it's going to go hunt for that data. And what Velociraptor has is these things called artifacts, which, enca which encapsulate expert knowledge, and it's going to go off and actually perform that action and perform that hunt. So we can see that it's going off and it's looking on the local endpoint. It's performing a query for that particular hash, and it did find that file and that hash on an endpoint. And what it's going to do here is once it finds it, this particular artifact here is actually going to check and say, are there any completed flows that you know completed successfully, basically? And you know, do they meet this criteria? Were they executed by security onion? And did they have uh, this particular artifact, uh, regular expression in there? Uh, and it's going to say, if so, then if there are results, then I need to quarantine this host. So then it executes this Windows remediation quarantine here, uh, which is going to basically put that endpoint into a quarantine status to where we can go investigate it manually with Velociraptor or do other uh, perform other response actions, right? So again, we could call out, we could call the quarantine artifacts or action from NADN if we wanted to manually, but sometimes it's just best to utilize you know, certain components of platforms that work best and just you know, maybe use NADN as the glue to get there and then uh, and go from there, right? It just depends on your use case. So uh, again, we've basically taken that observable data that we found from that alert and security in it. We've taken it all the way through NADN. It's used Velociraptor and its API to execute a hunt across maybe a thousand endpoints and then automatically quarantined all of those hosts, right? And then if we want to go off and send an additional notification from there saying that all of these endpoints were quarantined, we can certainly do that as well. But if you want to check that out in more detail, I'll stop rambling and, and you can go off and watch that in your own time later. Um, there is a video on YouTube there, an example video about how to set all that up. Um, I will mention that we do not use the Hive anymore in security settings, so uh, it would be without this Hive component here, and I will be rewriting that particular article and putting up a new video very soon to address that. But um, you know, if you do have questions or you do have an interest in that, please let me know. Uh, other than that, I think that is all that I have. And uh, you know, if you want to ask any questions on Twitter, please feel free to reach out to uh, the real Debbie Lambert or uh, if you want to check out that code, please be sure to check out my GitHub there, and uh, I'll be glad to answer any questions that you have in the Q&A and uh, elsewhere. So thank you. All right. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Wes, for yeah. sharing this. I can see already people are finding this really useful, and they are going to uh, try out anytime in the security sec space if they haven't. So thank you once again for sharing this.